John chapter 6, I'm going to start reading at verse 22. Please listen carefully, for this is God's word. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man would give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So for the next couple months, we're going to be looking at the I am sayings of Jesus. You know, many times all of us here have heard that on our front door. We hear this, we answer it, and it's a religious organization. And if you've talked to this religious organization for any amount of time or read their literature, you're going to find out that they believe that Jesus is not God. That Jesus never claimed to be God anywhere in the Bible. They don't believe in the Trinity. Well, every time Jesus says, I am the bread, or I am the light of the world, or I am the gate, on and on. What he's saying in the Greek is ego, ego eni. I am. And he's referring back to Exodus chapter th 3, where God spoke to Moses in the bush and said, I am who I am. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And the, Jew, the leaders knew every time Jesus said that, he was claiming to be God. That's why on several occasions they picked up stones to stone him. Matter of fact, if you go up to any Jewish person who knows Greek and ask them, did Jesus ever claim to be God? They're going to respond, yes, he did, many times. We just can't see it that clear in English. But beloved, Jesus claimed to be God. Now, when you look at this, so this is the first I am. And he says, I am the bread of life. And before we get to that verse, it's also important to remember that it says, I am the bread of life. There is a definite article there. And, what, and that the reason that is so important is because when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, He's, he's saying, I'm the only bread of life. He could have said, I am a bread of life, meaning there's many other ways to the Father. But he says, I am the bread of life. Now, we have the crowd here. They've come. They, they're, they're the ones that were fed in John chapter 6, verse 1 through 15. The multitudes that were fed with a few fish and a few bread. 5,000 that were miraculously fed by Jesus. So they're coming. They're continually seeking Jesus. This is the crowd that's following him. A matter of fact, why are they following? Why are they pursuing Jesus? Because their physical needs were met. Their hunger was met. But the way that's crafted in this, I think the Holy Spirit wants us to see that they're more motivated, more by hunger or selfish needs than humility in coming to Christ. When somebody comes to Christ, in a saving relationship, or to be saved, they're coming in humility. They're coming with, with the, the sense of the, all their sin upon them, and they're crying out for mercy to God, humbly seeking God's mercy to be saved. But we've all done this. Before we came to Christ, we've all done this. And, and you, you can watch through this chapter, chapter 6, how the crowd is progressing and knowing Christ. But in reality, and Jesus is going to gently correct each one of their flaws that they have of who he is, because the crowd's pursuit of Jesus 
and what they think he represents is going to be contrasted with his true identity. And this is what Jesus is going to be revealing to them, his true identity. And you know that bread is a picture of food that nourishes and sustains our earthly lives. And Jesus is the true bread, the bread, coming down from heaven that gives spiritual life to the world. See, deep down, we're born sinners. Every human being is born a sinner. It's called the origin of sin. It's called being in Adam. Jesus Christ is our second Adam. But because we're in Adam, we're born sinners. But yet, the image of God is not completely erased in us. We still have that desire, that hole, if you will, of, of seeking God, of having, we're created as a human being to be to have a personal relationship with the God of heaven. That's how we were created. And nothing's going to satisfy that desire until we enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, verse 29, before we move on, in verse 29, it's important to see, it says, they, where is it? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And that word believe is in the present tense. And why that's important is because believing in Jesus is less an act of faith and more about a life of faith. When we make that initial commitment, when we're born again, when our nature has been changed, our initial reception of Jesus Christ is going to lead into a life of obedience because of our new nature, because of our new desires. That's what being born again is about. And we will live a consistent life of faith. Yes, there will be times when we fall and God has to pick us up when we sin and get us back on the road. But our priorities have changed. And the way you can know if you're truly born again is by if your life is being more and more transformed in the likeness of Jesus Christ. So we see here, but look at it, verses 22 through 29. The crowd is, it moves from their physical needs or their physical desires to a works-related salvation. Because look what they say. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? In other words, what they're saying to Jesus is, just give us this list, this a list of regulations, a list of commands. Tell us what to do in order to satisfy God. It's a works-related relation, works-related uh, salvation that they're seeking after. It's like a young, rich ruler came to Jesus and said, I've kept all these commands. What else do I need to do to inherit eternal life? That's just our natural inclination. It might be we come to Jesus with the wrong motive. We come to him just what he can give us, our selfish desires. What can you give me? Can you satisfy this material need or financial need? Or we come to him in a works-related mentality. What must I do? Give me a list. Where in the Bible does it say a list I have to keep, regulations I have to keep in order to be saved? But what Jesus says is, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he have sent. It's kind of an oxymoron. Because what's going on here, Jesus is saying, this is the work of God. First of all, the work of the Father is that I come into the world, I live a sinless life, and I offer myself up for a, person, for a sacrifice for sin. That's the work of God. And your job, if you accept me as your Savior, is to rest in what I have done for you. That's your work, to rest in my sinless life and my righteousness. To come to the end of yourself and understand and realize that no matter how moral I think I can be, it's never going to satisfy a sinless life. That it's not my righteousness that's going to get me into heaven, it's Christ's righteousness that I'm under. But look at verses 30 through 34. It says, So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, 
but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And the reason I say because verse 34 is sarcastic. It's a sarcastic language that's dressed up in a respectful form. They're not being polite to Jesus. They're kind of mocking Jesus. But see, now they're coming. Look, first they come with the wrong motive, trying to satisfy their own carnal desires. Now they're coming to Jesus trying to find out what works do they have to do in order to be saved, what works related salvation. And now Jesus is going to gently rebuke them for their tradition that they had of who the Redeemer is going to be. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that tradition that's sometimes hard for us to break out of. Before we were Christian, a lot of it depended on the church we attended, the people we talked to. We get this entrenched uh, tradition in our mind of who God is and how what the Bible teaches, and then we become saved, and we have to undo all that tradition. That's what the Holy Spirit does. But look what happens here. Because Jesus says, first of all, uh, you're looking at the wrong thing. You're looking at Moses. You're giving Moses too much credence here. You're saying Moses gave us the bread from heaven. Jesus says, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. God gave you the bread from heaven. And you know, in 2 Barak 29.8, and that's kind of a, a Jewish commentary that the, that the Jewish people went by. And I don't know how prevalent this was, but it was taught that Moses was the first redeemer and the prophet would be the second redeemer. And if you read throughout the Old Testament, it says there'll be a prophet like Moses that comes. And I think even in, in the Gospel of John, they ask, are you the prophet who is to come? So what was taught, and I don't know how wide it was, this teaching, but what was taught was that Moses was the first redeemer and that the prophet or the Messiah would be the second redeemer. But Jesus is claiming to them that there's only, always has only been one redeemer, and it was not Moses. And what he's about ready to say is, uh, I'm ready to, I am the bread of life. I am the one and only Redeemer, which was absolutely revolutionary. But look at verse 35 and 36. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. There it is, the I am who I am. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Okay, Jesus is using the most basic and foundational needs of a human life, bread and water. And he's saying that in me, and in me only, not in other religions, not in other prophets, not in other, there's no other Messiah, there's not many ways to heaven, there's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus embodies in his person all the promises of satisfaction. He meets every need we have. He is the recipe for the soul. That's what he's telling them. And one of the scariest verses is, But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. The crowd has seen and heard God in the flesh. And yet... The encounter has aroused not their faith, but their curiosity, their physical appetites, and political ambitions. Remember last week when Moses, when God said to Moses, don't go any further. Stop right there and take the sandals off your feet. You see, in other words, God is saying, this is as far as you're going to come towards me. Be satisfied. Allow your conscience to be satisfied with the revelation I'm giving you. Don't let your curiosity take you any further. There, in a lot of the crowd is more of a curiosity that they're following Jesus after he fed them. It's curiosity. They like to hear him. They like to see him do these miracles. It's curiosity. And others, their physical desires and their physical appetites have been met, and they want Jesus with the wrong motive and what they can get from him. And others follow Jesus or want to hear Jesus because out of political ambitions. Because 
many of the leaders, many of the Jewish people at that time were expecting the Redeemer to be a political rule, to, to take Israel out of the bondage of Rome and lead their military revolt. That's how they pictured the Messiah. And aren't we glad today that we do not worship government, that we worship Jesus Christ? But when we get to verse 37 through 40, and I've talked about this before, and I've used these verses for a message on eternal security, that you can never lose your salvation. But this time, when I read these next verses, 37 through 40, listen to how many times the will of God is discussed in these verses. Starting in verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. You know, in verse 37, it says, All that the Father gives me, that is neuter and singular. And thus, it is referring to, not to individuals, but to a general quality of persons. And that quality is only that which the Father can give. But right here in this verse, we see divine sovereignty and man's responsibility all that the father gives me all that the father chooses to give to christ will come to me that's our responsibility to come to christ but notice how, how many times in those verses we hear the will of god the will of god for jesus christ was to the father's will would the will for Jesus Christ was to fulfill the Father's perfect will for his life, which meant to come down to earth, live a sinless life, and, and offer himself up for a sinless sacrifice. And Jesus carried this out perfectly. He fulfilled the Father's perfect will. And you know, that's why when we talk about eternal security, all that the Father gives me will come to me. The one who comes to me, I will never lose. So the Father has given somebody to Jesus Christ for salvation. And Jesus should lose that person, and that person should lose their salvation, and Jesus Christ has not fulfilled the Father's will. But what I want to talk about for a few minutes today is what's the will for us? What's the will of God for us? We know what the will of Jesus Christ was. The will for Jesus was to fulfill the Father's perfect will, which is to live a sinless life and be a sinless sacrifice. What's the God's will for our lives? Well, there are certain things that are just are not open for debate. And I mentioned last week uh, when Moses, when he was in the desert for 40 years, and God came to him in the burning bush and said, Moses, I'm going to send you back to Egypt to deliver my people. And Moses' first response was, who am I to go? Now, that wasn't sin. That was... God telling Jesus, I mean, that, that, that was God telling Moses, I'm going to send you to deliver two million people. And here's Moses been in the wilderness for 40 years. First thing that comes into his mind is, am I hearing God right? How am I going to deliver two, two million people after being in the desert for 40 years? But you see, beloved, he never takes, God never takes a fish and puts it out of water. He's always working in your life to accomplish the next stage of, your, of his will in your life. He doesn't just do it blindly. But there are times when we hear God telling us to do something that is beyond our recognition, it's beyond our ability to even think we could do something like that, that God's going to use us. And that's the time when we may dialogue with God. Am I sure I'm hearing God right here? Is this really God speaking to me? Does he really want me to go do this? There's nothing wrong with that. But as Moses, I think it was his fifth time when he asked, well, who am I to go, that it became sin. It became unbelief. Remember Jeremiah, when God said to Jeremiah, 
I want you to go to speak to my people, Israel, and the leaders. And Jeremiah said, send somebody else. I'm too young to do this. That wasn't sin. That was just Jeremiah getting clarification. You really, it's the same with Jonah. Jonah, I want you to go halfway across the world and go to Nineveh and preach the gospel to them. And Jonah's first, well, first impression was, did I hear you right? There's nothing wrong with that. But there are a lot of things that are not open for debate. That even if we question it, it's sin. For instance, assemble with others in worship. Hebrews 10.25. Marry only another Christian. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Raise children by God's standards, Ephesians 6, 4. Obey and honor your parents, Ephesians 6, 1 and 2. Support one's own family, 1 Timothy 5, 8. Proclaim Christ, witness for Christ, Acts 1, 8. Meditate, read the scriptures, Psalm 1, 2. Show love to others, 1 Corinthians 13. And I can go on and on. That's why we need to know the word of God. There are certain commands that the, that's not open for debate. And we just need to, what does it say? I think it's in 1 Thessalonians. This is the will of God for you, your sanctification. We don't have to ask God, do you want me to become more holy? Do you want me to progress in the faith? God's command is to do that. It's not open for debate. But when God tells us to do something, that seems way out of bounds, way out of left field, and our first impression is, are you sure, am I sure I'm hearing God right? And you come to him to get more information. That's not sin, beloved. But in, in reality, Moses would have stopped and thought about it for a second. Who am I to go deliver two million people? But in reality, 60, 70 years earlier, he was raised in the palace. He knew how the palace worked. He had relationships with people within that palace. He was raised in Pharaoh's family. He was the right person to go deliver them. But the Lord had to humble him first. So that's what's important. When we have a major decision to make, we need to bring it before the Lord. Or if somebody comes to you seeking God's will for their life, here's some advice. Do not tell a person what he, or, uh, what he or she should do, even if it seems obvious to you. The person is seeking God's will, not yours. And we need to re always remember that. Matter of fact, if you're seeking God's will in a certain decision that you have to make that could alter your life, could alter other people's lives, there's nothing wrong with getting advice, especially from other Christians. But in the end, you're the one that's going to have to make that decision. That's why it's so important to cultivate your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to encourage the person to wait on God's answer. He will reveal his will to those who earnestly seek him. And, and that's the important key. We have to earnestly seek Christ with the right motives. Remember, God is more, way more patient than we are. And I think of Jeremiah 17, 10, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. So when we're seeking the Lord's will about a decision we have to make, and you're earnestly, with the right motives, coming to seek the Lord for it, be patient. Wait for his answer. Uh, matter of fact, there are many times when we might come with wrong motives, just like the crowd. But you see, it's even through that process that the Lord's reshaping our motives, our desires to match his desires. The Lord, because you see, the Lord is more interested in a relationship in which we lean on him daily for our strength and, we, and guidance. He will not show you your entire life's journey. We must rely on him daily. That's what he wants. That's what he what glorifies him when, we're, when we are relying on him daily, going step by step. Do not allow superstitions to enter into the decision-making process, such as, and we probably might have all done this before, such as pointing blindly to a passage in the Bible or following some coincidence. See, the Lord uses his word, prayer, not luck or superstition. And that's really important to remember. 
See, it's much easier to see God in the rear view mirror than through the windshield. It's much easier. And what I mean by that, this means that as we look back on our lives, we can usually see how the Lord was working and how he was actively involved. Remember, it's easier to see God through the rear view mirror than through the windshield. Audrey's a perfect example. Audrey's in the process of selling her house and making a life-altering decision in her life. It's going to affect everything. And I talked to her on Friday, and she told me how this, uh, this couple from Arizona were interested in, in her house, but they hadn't seen it yet. And by the way she described it, I said the same thing Audrey did. It sounds like this is the Lord's will. It sounds like it's going to happen. 99% sure it's going to happen. But then what Audrey responded to me and said, but I still need to seek the Lord's will. You see, until it actually happens, only then do we know what the Lord's will was. Let me say it again. It's much easier to see God in the rear view mirror than through the windshield. God will show you his will. James 1, 5, and 6. He wants to reveal his will to you even more than you want to know. So be patient. Faith and action go hand in hand. Search the scriptures. Be in prayer. Fellowship with other mature believers. God will speak through other people. He will speak in scripture. He will speak to you in prayer. He wants you to know his will even more than you want to know it. But beloved, in the end, that's why it's so extremely important to cultivate that personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Because in the end, you're the one that's going to make that decision.